So first of all, thank you very much for putting the paper on the, on the program. It's, it's a lot of fun to be here so far. Uh, so as you can see, this paper is uh, it's, so it's co-authored with uh, uh, François Gorio at BU. Uh, we've been working, working on this paper for uh, a couple of years now. So as you can see from the title, it's a bit ambiguous what we're doing. Um, so uh, we're going to take a, a model of financing investment, standard, and then we're going to extend it two dimensions. We're going to add long-term debt and uncertainty shock. Okay. So why should we care about long-term debt? Well. If you look at the recent literature on quantitative corporate finance, which is, uh, I guess, standardized by uh, the Hennessy Whited uh, GF05, they only consider short-term debt. So people go into those models and they can only borrow one period, and then they have to repay the full debt next period and reissue debt. And people usually interpret those models at the monthly or quarterly frequency, which might seem a bit strange, um, or at least counterfactual. The reason for that has been largely computational, it's pretty difficult, as I'll show you, to compute models with uh, long-term debt, okay? So as I, as I hinted to you already, it's not a costless simplification. Why is that? When you, uh, when you, sh when you assume that uh, firms have to repay everything next period, you basically set a one-period contract, you can basically c have the firm commit to an investment and a default policy. So in other words, if I go and I lend you 10 bucks, based on you invest $5 and you have a probability of default of 5%, I can enforce this. If now say I'll, I'm going to lend you a 10 period debt, I can only enforce that you invest what you say you're going to invest over one period. Period two, three, four, five, you could take on more debt, invest a lot less, so you could dilute me. Okay? So it's a commitment problem here. I'm going to refer to this as agency costs. So having multi-period debt create potentially agency costs and how important are they on distorting investment? Well, we're not really sure. Okay? The second thing is when you assume a one period debt, you build in the model, you hardwire in a maturity mismatch, and therefore you create a rollover risk, right? Firms don't have to, uh, to um, roll over their whole debt every period. They can actually roll over a lot less than that. So if they have a 10 period debt, quarterly they have to roll over one over 40 of, of their debt outstanding, okay? So this rollover risk when you have multi-period debt is alleviated quite a bit. So quantitatively, how important is this? So that's one of the motivation here. And we notoriously know that it's hard to generate uh, uh, large credit spreads uh, as we see in the data, okay? Without tweaking the model to death. Okay, we also introduced uncertainty shock. Um, so we're going to have uncertainty shock a la Bloom. Um, and why do we need that? Well, we have motivation about trying to match facts about the Q theory. Um, so Q theory, um, is supposed to be sufficient statistic for investment, as we've seen in uh, early papers from Abel and Ayashi. But there's been a long literature empirically that documents that it just doesn't work. So if you regress investment rate on Tobin's Q, the coefficient is very small in magnitude, it's small economically, and it's marginal uh, statistically. And then there's a whole bunch of problems when you start adding other controls like cash flows. Uh, some models appeal to measurement errors. So Erickson Whited, Eberly and Al um, are, are arguing this way. But there's more recent work in 2008 and 2009 by Gilchrist and co-authors and Thomas Philippon that actually construct a measure of Q using bond spreads, bond yields, right? return on bonds. And it seems to work pretty well. So working pretty well means that the correlation between credit spreads or bond yields with investment rates seem to, to be pretty high and drive out Tobin's Q. Okay? And I'll show you more about this. <coughs> Now, a bit of intuition. Why, why would uncertainty shock help? Well, first, let's think in the standard framework, shocks to productivity. Productivity goes up. Your probability of default as the firm goes down. Therefore, your credit spread will go down, right? So you'll pay, lo you'll pay less interest on your debt. That's obvious. At the same time, if Z goes up, then you want to invest more because the firm is more productive. And overall, Tobin's Q, which is market value of the firm over book value, is gonna, be, is gonna go up as well, right? Because the firm has become a lot more valuable as a result of that, okay? So you can see credit spread goes down, investment goes up. That creates a negative correlation between investment and spreads. And uh, Tobin's Q and investment go in the same direction, which is strongly positively correlated, okay? So that, that's the standard intuition. How about now if you bring a shock to volatility? So if the volatility of profits suddenly increase, so your distribution tomorrow is widening a lot, what happens? So let's think about an increase in volatility. Of course, it's gonna make you more risky. Your probability of default goes up, right? So your credit spread will go up quite a bit, okay? So that's very natural. 
At the same time, if you assume a structure of adjustment costs on investment, particularly if it's asymmetric, lots of work, including losing, has shown that, and, and early on, purely real side on Caballero has shown that an increase in volatility will make you invest a lot less, okay? Because you're, you think that if, if you have a very good shock, you might have to disinvest in the future because of this high volatility. So investment will go down, but Q will go up, right? So think about it again, Q, if your, pro if your volatility of, of your cash flows basically widens, you can reach much higher path, right? So until those cash flow realize and the book, the book value, uh, so K adjusts to that, your growth option essentially will be a lot bigger, okay? And this, um, this mechanics will be even stronger when the firm is close to default. So if you're close to default and your risk increase, it's good news for you, okay? So the question is, how much of this will happen quantitatively? So if you look at credit spread goes up, Q goes up, so it's still strongly negative correlated, just like shocks to productivity, but now we have the inverse relationship between Q and investment. Right? Investment goes down, Q goes up, so we have this negative correlation. And we'll argue that in the data, the correlation between investment rate and Q that we observe is a mix between a response to these two shocks, a positive correlation and a negative. Right? So the goal of this paper is to try to evaluate those quantitatively in a calibrated model. Okay? So what does this paper do? It will take a standard neoclassical model of financing and investment and incorporate long-term debt and stochastic volatility. And what we do is we explore the quantitative impacts of those two new uh, dimensions to the classic Hennessy Whiten and evaluate them quantitatively, okay? What do we find quickly? We find that having those two ingredients in contrast to a model with one pure debt and deterministic vol leads to lower, lower and more volatile leverage. So firms take on less leverage on average and they respond to shocks a lot uh, more aggressively. So it's more volatile. We find a higher probability of default and hence much higher credit spread, so closer to data. And we find that the explanatory power of credit spreads on investment are higher, and uh, it's decreasing also the explanatory power of Tobin's Q on I over K, which again gets us closer to data, okay? So let's get, let's get to the model. So the model builds on a uh, uh, recent paper by Gomez and Schmidt. Um, so we're gonna have a fully dynamic model. It's gonna be partial equilibrium. Um, and we're going to add an exogenous pricing kernel. The financial decisions of the firm will be how much debt to issue every period and how much equity to issue, as well as defaulting on the financial obligations. Okay? The real decision will be investment. Okay? So I'll choose how much to invest in capital every period. The departure from the literature, as I highlighted already, is we're going to have shocks to the volatility of productivity, and we're going to have long-term debt. Okay? So time is discrete and it's infinite horizon problem. We're gonna have three shocks in this model, one aggregate shock of productivity, ZA for aggregate, and two idiosyncratic shock, the productivity uh, ZI, and uh, we're gonna have shocks in volatility, and that's idiosyncratic volatility, okay? So ZA is aggregate, and ZI and sigma are idiosyncratic, so firm, firm by firm. So what does it mean to get a sigma low today? It means that the distribution of your productivity shock tomorrow is as a low, as a low volatility, okay? So sigma today drives the distribution of tomorrow's shocks, ZI, okay? So we're gonna collect those three states into the state vector S. We're gonna have ZA, ZI, and sigma, okay? Firm produce uh, using capital K, okay? So we're gonna have a, uh, a pi production function. We're gonna invest capital. We're gonna assume uh, here that capital is irreversible, so we can only uh, have a positive investment. So if we want to lower capital stock, we just let the firm depreciate, okay? just the capital depreciate. We're gonna have a linear adjustment costs of phi plus uh, when we go up. So if we uh, invest two bucks, now we're gonna have 5%, uh, so a, uh, a buck, uh, 10 cents of, of adjustment costs. Uh, we're gonna have long-term debt. So there's different ways one can model long-term debt. If you start doing a multi-peer debt, so three-peer debt, you're gonna have you need a state space for two-peer debt and one-peer debt. If you have 20-peer debt, you're gonna need 20 state variables. Not very economical. So what we use, we use the, the, um, the toolkit of uh, Leland and Toft uh, introduced, which is we're gonna have an exponentially decaying debt. So you're gonna have a debt where you could just repay delta percent every period of the outstanding debt. So it's gonna be, the, the, the cash flows are gonna be exponentially decaying over time, okay? So this gives us still a concept of duration and some sort of a, a measure of how, how long-term long the debt is. 
Firms can issue equity. That's when a dividend D will be negative. We're going to interpret this as the equity issuance. Uh, firm equity is denoted V. When it's negative, um, the firm will default. Okay? So if the value of operating the firm from the equity perspective is minus 3, the equity holders just default, walk away, get nothing. The, the bondholders take whatever is left of the value of the firm. Okay? And I'll show you uh, what it is. This tax is in the model, so profit at, are taxed, but you can shield the interest expense on the debt, which gives us this dynamic trade-off uh, model of, of Hennessy White debt, essentially. Okay, so equity value is the expected discounted stream of dividend D, so you can write the problem recursively that way, V, maximize over investment and debt of this discounted sum of D. We discount life here according to this exogenously uh, determined pricing kernel, exogenously set pricing kernel, which depends on the aggregate state. I'll show you the specification. And tomorrow's continuation value is the max of zero of V prime. So like I said, if V is negative, you default and it takes zero. Yes? Is there any bankruptcy costs? Yes, I'll show you that. Oh. Yeah, there's financial frictions, which will pin down uh, the, the, the trade-off for that. Yeah, I'll show you these explicitly. So let me go to the budget constraint. Um, so we know exactly what we're talking about. So we have profit pi. Uh, they're taxed, so that's after tax profit. Here you issue a new loan. New loan issued are denoted by L. I'll get to that. And the price of these, that you get for this new loan is Q. You repay your debt, as I say, at a rate delta B per period. So if delta is 0.5, you repay 50% of your debt outstanding. If delta is 0.1, you repay 10% of your debt outstanding, okay? Regardless of when it was issued. You pay your investment and you pay your cost of investment. Okay? When this, when this uh, uh, budget constraint is negative here, when D is negative, uh, we interpret this as an, as an equity issuance, so we're going to add a 1 plus lambda. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you, uh, if you issue $1, it's going to cost you uh, $1.1, right? If lambda is 10%. So we have uh, one aspect of financial frictions here, which is this lambda cost when D is negative. Okay? The new loans L are going to be the new debt level that you choose minus B, minus the delta V that you just repaid, okay? So you have $10 outstanding, you pay it down to $9, you go back to $11, your new loans are $2, okay? So pretty simple. So it's very, very reminiscent of investment capital, essentially, right? Okay, so one thing we need to determine is this Q. So how much do I get if I issue $2? So that's where the, uh, the agency cost will kick in, essentially. So Q is going to denote the price of a $1 loan and it's going to be the discounted sum of the payments on the bond. So contingent on no default, so this indicator is indicator of you continue operating. You're going to repay delta, right? So you, you should one dollar, repay delta tomorrow. If you default, then you're going to um, walk equity holders walk away with nothing, and debt holder recuperate K over B, which is the assets in place divided by a number of, of debt holders' claimants, and then uh, you lose a, a portion of this one minus xi. So you recover on xi percent, xi is a number less than one. So if xi is 0.8, upon default is 20% of, of waste in the economy. So those are, you're paying expected cost of, of default, essentially. So next period you come, you discount uh, t between t and t plus two. Um, the debt left over of this one dollar is one minus delta, and you pay delta percent of this, okay? If you default, you get a one minus delta claim on capital divided by total, cap total debt outstanding and so on and so forth. So you can write this big mess as an infinite sum of the discounted um, repayment contingent on the firm is alive. And you can pay and, and, you, will, and the, the, uh, you will have a terminal payout which is equal to this recovery value with this uh, XI date weight loss in it, okay? As you can see, the, the as the look of this infinite sum, you can probably write this recursively, um, which is how we solve this. So the price of a loan today, depending on how much K prime and B prime the firm chooses, is going to be the payout in uh, continuation, so delta. And then once you've been paid delta, you have one minus delta claim in the bond tomorrow, right? If you default, you get a default payout again. So it's pretty nice. Once you know the firm policies, once you know what, what the firm does in terms of investment and, and debt, you know what your claim will be tomorrow. So now solving for the lender's, uh, up lender's price is essentially solving for this functional form Q, which is a recursion, okay? So it's gonna be a, a fixed point here. As I said before, um, taxes can, uh, profits are taxed, but you can shield interest expenses. 
So we're going to embed this into the, the bond price Q, so, the, so that the firm will issue a bond at 90 cents on the dollar, but we'll get, say, 91, 92 cents, because the tax benefits are embedded in it. How do we compute this? Well, uh, if the firm does not default, the, the yield on the bond is going to be 1 over 1 plus C, the bond yield, times the payout, right? That's how we compute bond yield uh, in a fixed income class. Well, now you add the 1 minus tau, where you shield this interest expense, and you can basically uh, write this Q, this Q tilde that has a tax shield embedded in it as a function of the Q and the tau. So now if we know the, sched if we know the schedule Q and T, that's at if we know schedule Q that satisfies this equation, and we know the tax rate tau, then we know how much the firm gets as a subsidized bond price. Okay? So, so that's, that's, that's built in already. Okay? So what, what does the firm do? Maximizes present discount value of dividend, subject to default. Um, this is our budget constraint, and this Q tilde embeds the tax benefit. Okay? Investment is irreversible, and the new loans are defined this way. Okay? So the, no the notion of equilibrium in our model, as you probably figured out already, is, is a fixed point between what the equity holder do in terms of investment, debt, and default, and what the bondholder uh, will, will lend to the firm. So it's an equilibrium between what the firm does and the loan price schedule of the bondholder. So this is a fixed point between these two things. Okay? So how do we solve this model? Well, we're going to have a, two, a double loop um, happening. Uh, first, we're going to conjecture a bond price, so a Q. And then we're going to solve the firm problem. So we're going to conjecture Q, given Q. Let's solve this V. Once we solve this V, we're going to have those, uh, those policies. Then we're going to plug those policies and solve for the bond price. And we're going to go back and forth. And we're going to update the bond price until all of these policies have converged. Okay? It's very time consuming because it's a pretty large problem, as you've seen. Um, and moreover, this has been uh, shown in the literature that when you have long-term debt and default, it's very hard to converge. And uh, as I started computing this, this beast, it just would never converge. Okay? Uh, Chatterjee and co-author provide an algorithm that functions really well with these models. And essentially, the problem in this model is that the, the, budget, the budget set is not convex, so it creates local, local maxima, and then there's numerical oscillation. The trick is to add uh, a continuous shock to the model to essentially locally uh, convexify the set, which numerically uh, ensures convergence. So these guys did this in the context of sovereign debt default, and uh, they highlight that this, this algorithm works really well. What we did is we took that idea and embedded this, and we incorporated endogenous investment. So there were a few things to change, but we were able to replicate this, and it works. The downside is make computations even slower, because now we have an extra dimension of complication. So how did we transform the model? Uh, we had to add a very economically small shock, but continuous shock, that was IID, to profits. So we're going to add an M, which is going to be a truncated normal, with a very small uh, variance. So you can think of this as a, as a little cost shock. So you realize your profit, and you get this teeny tiny continuous shock. Okay? So economically, it doesn't change much, but con convexifies the set. For this algorithm to work, we need um, the value function, the maximum, to be strictly concave. It, might not, it needs not be. So what we do is we add a very small dividend smoothing motive. Instead of maximizing the present discount value of dividend, we, pre we, we maximize this present discounted sum of H of D, which is slightly uh, concavified here. So we have kappa virtually changes nothing economically, but it ensures that it's strictly concave, and, and it works. Okay? So solving this algorithm now requires an extra dimension, which means we need to solve uh, exactly uh, the default threshold where the firms mix the policy. Right? So we're going to need to compute that, and we're going to have to have very slow relaxation on the bond price update. So when you compute your new bond price, you're going to add, you're going to uh, update the old bond price, but by a very teeny tiny amount. And that's how that, that's what will ensure conversions. Okay. So final slide of boring you with numerical details. Uh, we discretized uh, the state space. There are three shocks and two choices. It's a big grid. We implement this using CUDA code on, on Fermi cards. The typical run is five hours. And using those GPU computing, we speed up by 500. So I'll, that, that's why people haven't solved these things before, because just take darn too long. Once we solve this, uh, this problem, uh, we do Monte Carlo simulation. So we, simul we simulate panels of 10,000 firms over 200 periods. And then we compute all the statistics and regressions that we want in there and compare this to data. And that's our quantitative exercise. Once we do this, we can shut down some channels. 
resolve the model with some channels shut down and, and, and see the difference, okay? So the productivity process is NAR1, uh, persistent, 0.85, small, small volatility. The discount factor is, I would call it a la Luzang. It's got a little bit of risk premium. Uh, we set it to 15. And we set it up in a way that uh, no matter what state you're in, your, your risk rate is, is, your discount rate is beta. So the term structure is flat. So when I compare one period debt to a 10 period debt, we're not gonna have weird things with the term structure coming in, okay? So that's flush, flushing that out of the model. The idiosyncratic process is also gonna be an AR1 with a fairly persistent parameter. And the sigma here is gonna be discretized in a two-state Markov chain. We're gonna have a low, a low shock and a high shock, 10%, 25%, and this is a transition matrix, okay? The profit, uh, is going to be decreasing return to scale. It's a fixed cost of operating. That's that, that little continuous shock M that is required for computational purposes, okay? Uh, the adjustment cost, as I said, is irreversible and uh, linear on the upside. So we, we try to choose all of these parameters, alpha, F, delta, K, and phi, in a way to, to try to match the data the best way that we can, okay? So I just wanna tell you right now that this calibration is not optimal. We're still working on it to improve it, but we think that's a good starting point, okay? Um, the equity issuance costs are 25%. The recovery on bankruptcy is 80%. Tax rates are 20%. So those are institutional parameters that will pin down the trade-off uh, for leverage, okay? So the, the policy that we're interested in, I told you about, are Tobin's Q. Uh, that's going to be equity value plus debt chosen, the debt tomorrow, over the investment to so the capital level tomorrow. So that's our Tobin's Q. Investment rate is standard, profitability is standard. Leverage is the B prime that we choose today over the K prime that we choose today as well, okay? So it's, it's looking forward in the model. And credit spread, as, as you guessed already, is related to the bond price Q. Of course, you have to adjust for the fact that it's long term, so it's not just one over Q minus one, okay? And default is we're gonna compute it as when the value function becomes negative, there's gonna be an instance of default, so we just truncate the sample from beginning to default, and then we, we, can, com we can look at statistics there, okay? So let me show you some uh, policies to get an idea of, of what's happening in the model before I show you numerical results. So um, we, plot the day, uh, we plot these policies versus K and B, the, the state, at the average productivity level for the low volatility shock. So you can see leverage is increasing in B, uh, which makes sense if you have a high debt to start with, you're gonna have ro to roll over a lot of debt, so that's increasing in B, that sounds uh, sensible. Investment, as we see, is very large for small firms, so for small K, which makes a lot of sense. Um, credit spread, uh, as you can see, when a firm is large with little debt, so this, this triangle here, virtually no credit risk, so very low credit spread, almost zero, and then increases uh, as you get close to default, okay? Now let me show you the difference between the high vol and the low vol. So when the firm gets hit with a high volatility, you see a decrease in investment and an increase in Tobin's Q when you get close to default, okay? So let's compare the data to our model. Uh, we can see we overshoot a bit on Tobin's Q. Uh, we get investment right, we get profitability right, we get leverage right, we get about credit spread right, we get a little bit more default. So that's, that, that's our benchmark. So roughly it's, it looks kosher. Now let's look at what's the effect of uh, both long-term and stochastic volatility compared to the benchmark one period model that we've seen. So, so what we do is we shut down that to one period and stochastic volatility to deterministic. What do we see? Q increased a little bit, but not by much. It's a little bit less volatile. Leverage increases a lot. And there's almost no credit spread, no default. Okay, so I told you that. The correlation between investment and credit spread in the one period world is virtually zero. In our world is minus, close to minus 0.2. So that, that's this negative correlation I told you about, okay? So if you start to, if you try to disentangle the two, between one period debt, the effect of stochastic volatility as mostly the effect of reducing leverage and increasing credit spread and default, okay? So that, that's what happens. The second, if, and it creates also a negative, uh, this negative correlation that we like. Once we add the one period, we add to five period debt, uh, same thing, not much action on Q, but, and, but still a decrease in leverage. So leverage keeps going down, a little bit more credit spread, a little bit of default. And the correlation increases from minus 0.10 to minus 0.17. So adding stochastic volatility and adding long-term debt helps us get closer to data, namely getting that, that, that number more, more negative, okay? Let me show an impulse response. So we, uh, we take the policies, uh, we, we feed in these shocks for a long time, till 100, then we get a very good productivity shock, then we stay there. For the one period debt, 
and then we'll go to five period debt. The only difference you see is one period debt, no default, no credit spread. When the firm gets a good productivity shock, increases uh, investment, does this by increasing leverage and going back to their steady state leverage, okay? Turbine stream increases, we've seen that. Five period debt, a lot more credit spreads, and basically the same idea, except that if you see leverage is a little bit lower, um, and, if, and lower in, in, in the long run as well. Now, if we look at the interesting shock, which is the long-term the long debt shock, the, the sigma shock. So volatility, um, productivity stay constant, but volatility is jacked up from 10 to 25%. What happens? Credit spreads go up quite a bit. Leverage goes down quite a bit. And investment goes down to zero, essentially. So the firm uh, let the capital depreciate. And Tobin's queue goes up. So as you can see, opposite effect. Investment goes up, Tobin's queue goes up for shock of Z. Tobin's queue goes up, but investment goes down. So that's this negative correlation I told you about, okay? So finally, the final thing I wanna show you is to show those impulse response, those dynamics in a bit more formal way people have done in the literature, is we regress investment on bond yield and Tobin's queue. This is data taken from uh, Gilchrist and co-author, and what they show is that if you regress investment just on bond yield, on credit spread, you get a negative number. You regress on Tobin's you get a positive number. And when you put them together, you can see that bond yield is really, credit spread is really the, the strong correlation and Tobin's you tend to decrease. So we'd like to emulate this in the data, okay? So we run the same regressions. So this is the data. This is our model with one period deterministic volatility. Then we turn on the volatility channel and then we turn on the five period debt channel. You can see that coefficient is even positive here. That coefficient becomes smaller and even smaller. So not quite there negatively, so not, not, not quite there yet, but clearly from 0.2 to uh, an order of magnitude lower. So that's, that's progress towards the negative number of the data. If you look at Tobin's Q, 0.36, very high, 0 0.2, 0 0.24. So we decrease it a little bit, but still the correlation is still there. So in a way, we, uh, we feel that this is getting us closer. So you, you might ask, so wh where does that come from? Well, what we did is we took the, the simulated data here and we split into two parts. The part that is far from default, so where the credit spread is less than 1%, and the portion of the data that is close to default, where the credit spread is higher than 1%. And we, re we did this regression separately, and you can see the negative number as in the data and the close to zero coefficient of turbine skew is really there when we're close to default. Right? And it's not there at all when we're far from default. So clearly this mechanism of this strong correlation, this feedback between uh, a cost to, to the cost of, of financing and how it impacts investment is really something that is happening when firms are close enough to default. And that really seems to be the driver here. So to conclude, um, in this paper we we'll provide a neoclassical model of investment where we add both stochastic volatility and long-term defaultable debt. We saw that using a standard calibra calibration in, in the literature, it reduces mean leverage quite a bit compared to the one period models, and increases the full probability and, and also the credit spread, which gets us to closer to data, even with a simple CRA uh, type pricing kernel. Um, we also increase the explanatory power of credit spread on I over K and decreases, and it decreases the explanatory power of Tobin's Q on I over K. So both of these uh, effect, quantitative effects are going cl making us closer to the data, okay? What we try to do, what we try to, um, what we'll try to do in the future is try to experiment for maybe um, more realistic adjustment cost. So get rid of, of uh, uh, irreversibility and positive uh, investment uh, costs, and to get into uh, something maybe more that will get us closer to data. And next, we're going to use the model to to measure those agency costs of that. So what we can do here is instead of maximizing equity value, we could in principle maximize total firm value, so equity plus debt. And that would give us the first best policy of the firm, right? Absent those, those agency costs. Then we can compare the distortion introduced by this agency cost. Okay, so that's, that's it.